This morning we're looking in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, at verse 9, and we're talking about living in Philadelphia. No, not in that city that you see up there. We'll, we'll explain it in a minute. It says, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, for indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you, so that you will behave toward outsiders and behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It's so clear and so uh, helpful to us, Lord, for everyday living. Lord, just speak to us today from it. Teach us from your word, Lord, to help us with the daily issues, the daily tribulations and trials and, and struggles that we have. Lord, there are so many that bombard us every single day, and, and we struggle each and every day with them. So, Father, help us as we turn to your word. Speak to us clearly and forcefully, Lord, so that we can... We can make it through these trying days, Lord, and we can find joy and peace and love in you. Amen. Well, probably by now, we've all heard the term agape love. Agape love, which of course refers to general Christian love. A lot of times, Bible translators render this term agape love as charity. But charity, I think, is really kind of a poor substitute for what is meant by the Greek word agape, agape love. When we hear the word charity, I think most of us think uh, or understand it to mean almsgiving, you know, helping the poor. You give to a charity. But agape love is love really in its fullest and most extensive meaning. True love to God, true love to, to others, to, to mankind, and, and a benevolent disposition of mind towards our fellow Christians, growing out of a sincere and fervent devotion to God. It's the kind of love which must characterize those who experience the agape of God. It, it should be exercised by Christians toward everyone, other Christians, people who are not, you know, don't even consider themselves as Christians, you know, whether the person merits it or not, we are to show this agape love. Uh, but our passage today speaks about another kind of love. You know, in English, we just have the term love. And uh, in Greek, uh, in, in uh, in other languages, but specifically we're talking about Greek now, there's these different kinds of love, different descriptions of love. And, and our passage speaks of Philadelphia love, brotherly love it's been called. And, and this is a love that's specifically between Christians. Outside the New Testament, this word is used to denote love which binds together the children of one father. Today, we tend to use the term to describe those who are united for a specific idea or a specific cause. In the New Testament, it is without exception used for the love uniting Christians to one another. Of course, we think of that city of Philadelphia when, because it's, it's named, it's called the city, city of brotherly love. Its name comes from that Greek word, Philadelphia. Uh, that's describing this type of love. And, and, and although we probably don't want to live there in the state of Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, uh, you know, we definitely ought to try to live in the state of Philadelphia, the state of brotherly love, right where we are, right here in Missouri. Uh, well, let's look at then how Paul describes this state of brotherly love, this condition of brotherly love among believers. Uh, living in Philadelphia inwardly, in other words. Love is the subject in these verses 
uh, that we've read, and, and the statement he makes here is really rather amazing. A believer must have love for the brethren. It's a supernatural love that's taught of God, the, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit, and one of them is love. And, and uh, it's not just some kind of abstract term. In other words, it can't just be love in the abstract. It must be love in the concrete. And, and such love can only be produced in the hearts of believers by the Holy Spirit. Notice that after Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit, brotherly love is the first thing he mentions. He writes there in verse 9. Now as to the love of the brethren... You have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. I believe that love is really the identifying mark of a child of God. It's the mark that describes us uh, and, and makes a difference between us and others. Two roommates in a college, we'll call them Vern and John. I'll tell you, these two young men could wrestle and fight and argue. They, they try to get dates with the same girl, you know, all those kinds of things. One day they really just had a knockdown, drag out fight. They literally tore up their dorm room. Now, it's not modern dorm rooms, back in the day, okay? But still, young men in those days would fight as well and fight over, over girls and, and fight each other. John proceeded to tell Vern what he thought of him, and it wasn't very complimentary. Then Vern proceeded to tell him what he thought of him, and that wasn't very complimentary either. But all of a sudden, it occurred to Vern, he was a believer. They both were. He said, look, you're the greatest proof that I'm a child of God. One of the evidences that a person is a child of God is that he loves his brother. The writer of, of the Gospel of John emphasizes it, and, and it's also in 1 Thessalonians that we're taught of God to love our brother. And then Burns said, in spite of the fact that you're the most contemptible person I've ever met, the most unlovely person I've ever met, I love you. John kind of looked startled and just began to laugh. Vern said, you know I love you. You're lots worse than I am. Now what you need to know about these two young men is that they went on to be pastors. And after this experience, whenever they would have an opportunity to, to meet one, one another, they would remember this event and remember that they really do love each other, not because they're not ornery scoundrels, but because they both loved each other because they were children of God. That love for each other is the proof that we're children of God. First of all, here in our passage, Paul takes notice of the love in them and he commends them for it. He, he takes special notice that God has taught them this love of one another. The love of the brethren. He, he, in verse 9 he says, For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Whoever does that which is good is taught by God. And, and the glory should be given to God. All who experience self, the salvation of God are taught this lesson. To love one another. This teaching of God's Spirit exceeds the teaching of men. I can tell you to love each other a lot of different times, a lot of different ways, but when God teaches you through His Word, through His Spirit, it exceeds man's teachings. And man's teaching is in vain and useless unless God also is here in the room teaching as well. The evidence that they'd been taught by God was the fact that they practiced this love toward the brethren who are in all Macedonia, it says. They actually did it. They didn't just love those of their own city and their own society or those who lived near them and, and thought the same way they did and dressed the same way they did and had the same skin color they had. They also loved those who were distant, perhaps differing 
in some opinions and practices and differing in political persuasion or in what sports team they supported or whatever the differences were. What Paul encourages them to do here is to increase more and more in this grace taught by God and to increase in carrying out their duty of brotherly love. Show even more love. Even though there's in a sense no need to exhort them in brotherly love as, as if it was lacking altogether, there is reason to encourage them to pray for more and to work for more in this area. None of us love in perfection, amen? Even the most loving Christian has room for improvement. Nobody's perfect. It seems that in a lot of things we do, if we want to improve, we have to practice those things. I've shared with you before that on one occasion, the famous pianist Van Cliburn was asked how much time he spent practicing. Without hesitation, Van Cliburn said, I practice eight to nine hours a day. He noted that two of those hours were invested in nothing more than scales and fingering exercises. The basics, he called them. The price tag of excellence is very high. Look at the professional athletes, professional baseball players still take batting practice and fielding practice. If they were to stop practicing, then they would get rusty, they'd probably miss a lot of plays, and they'd probably end up losing their jobs. But how many times have we ignored our coach, ignored our teacher here in this area of brotherly love? He's teaching us the finer points of brotherly love, and, and yet we ignore what he says too often. That person is too different from us, we might say. That, you know, that one's just strange over there, and, and all sorts of excuses that we give why we, we're not loving people as we ought to, but, you know, we'll just wait until somebody more compatible comes along, and then we can really love that person. Are we getting rusty when we're doing that? Of course we are. As Christians, as children of God, we have a duty to love one another. And if we fail in that task, I'm afraid we pray that we too might lose our jobs. In effect, we take ourselves out of the game whenever we behave that way. Next, Paul discusses the outward effects of this love, living in Philadelphia outwardly. The Phillips translation of verse 11 starts out, and make it your ambition to have no ambition. This points out the paradox here. The exact meaning of the words isn't terribly clear. The, the, the verb here could be to be ambitious or to seek restlessly. Kind of similar. But whether you take it to make it your ambition to be unambitious or to seek restlessly to be still, you still have a very colorful expression here. And in, in, in describing this unambitious or quiet life, Paul says to attend to your own business and work with your hands. Get busy about this. The reason for this emphasis on, on quiet life is that there's, there's evidence that some of the Thessalonians were restless. And because they thought that Jesus was going to return real soon, they weren't doing any work. Two reasons are given for this lifestyle. Number one, so that you may behave properly toward outsiders. And number two, not be in any need. Regarding proper behavior, in one sense, the Christian ought to live without caring about what the world thinks because he's living to please God according to God's standards and not the world's standards. You know. But in the other sense, he must also think of the effect of his actions on other people. You know, Think about his testimony, in other words. Being careful to not discredit his faith by careless actions and appearances. In this instance, the Thessalonians had a reputation for brotherly love. Evidently, it was so strong that some who'd stopped working were living on the kindness of others. And this was a testimony to the charity of those who provided for them. But the effect of, of those who were mooching, this, this affected the outsiders who saw it in a negative way. As somebody once said, you're never completely worthless. You can always be a bad example. And these folks were being a bad example, mooching off the brotherly love of their Christian brothers and sisters, and they shouldn't be doing that. 
And these lazy Christians were setting a very bad example. And the second reason for this quiet lifestyle is so that they might be independent. If some were taking advantage of the charity of others, they needed to be told to be independent of others. Take care of themselves. To avoid burdening others and, and behavior which others might see as scandalous. We learn so much throughout the Bible, but I always turn to Psalm 23 in difficult times, and, and we learn there that we shall not be in want. Not because our brothers in Christ fill our needs or, or, or something in this world is sufficient, but because the Lord is our shepherd. A story is told about a minister who taught an old man in his congregation how to read the Bible. He proved to be a very gifted scholar. After the, the teaching had come to an end, the preacher wasn't able to visit for some time. And when, when he did, he only found the man's wife at home. And so he asked him, you know, how's John doing? He's fine, sir. How's he doing with his reading? Nicely, sir. Ah, I suppose he'll read his Bible very easily now. Bible, sir? Bless you. He was out of the Bible and into the newspaper long ago. There are many other people like that old man who've been out of the Bible and into the newspaper or uh, the news report on TV now and forsaken the fountain of living waters and have gone on uh, along the muddy pools and the stagnant waters to try to find something which might quench their thirst and of course they would find nothing there not realizing they've already overlooked the only source which can fully satisfy them which is the word of god we ought to be trusting in him living a life which will honor him and if, if, if we do something that's thought of as deplorable or scandalous by non-christians obviously that won't honor god satan is very busy uh, to cause our lives to not be quiet. He is very interested in encouraging us to meddle in other people's affairs and to use and to abuse the kindnesses of others. He has, in essence, become bad witnesses, bad testimonies. But we shouldn't listen to it. Christianity doesn't excuse us from our work and responsibility it teaches us to be diligent in our work and our responsibilities, to be examples for others. So what Paul is saying is that we're to work diligently at loving one another. We're to act in ways that show God's love at work. The Russian author Leo Tolstoy, he tells a story about an old Russian cobbler who was reading in Luke 7 about the Pharisee who didn't welcome Jesus to his home. And he thought to himself, you know, if Jesus came to my home, I would welcome him. I believe I would. Thinking about that, he fell asleep, and suddenly the old man heard a voice calling his name. Martin, Martin, look out in the street tomorrow, for I shall come. The next day he kept watch out of his window as he worked, and he saw an old man that he knew he invited him in to sit by his fire, gave him some tea. He told the, the man about Christ's mercy and as you know, he'd been reading in the Gospels and sharing with him what he'd learned. The old man listened with tears running down his cheeks and left thanking him for his hospitality. A while later, Martin saw outside a, a woman dressed in shabby summer clothes trying to keep her baby warm. It was wintertime. He invited her in to sit by his fire. You know, she was very poor. She had already pawned her shawl the day before in order to get something to eat. He fed her, gave her an old coat to wrap her baby in, gave her the money to get the shawl out of the pawn. Later, he helped reconcile a poor woman and a boy who stole an apple from her. So the day passed, but there had been no appearance of Jesus Christ, only these others that he had seen. It was evening now, and Martin lit his lamp and opened his Bible. He'd intended to read where he'd left off the night before, but the Bible fell open to another place. And, you know, before he read, he heard a voice call out, 
Martin, it is I. He looked up and saw the old man he helped, and then he vanished, and it was repeated, of course, with the woman and, and her baby, and with the woman and the boy and, that he'd helped that day. And then he read, I was in hunger, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. It was a stranger, and he took me in. The bottom of the page he read, Inasmuch as you did it unto one of these, my brethren, even these least, you did it unto me. Tolstoy concludes his story, And Martin understood that his dream had come true, and that the Savior had really come to him on that day, and he had welcomed him. That poor cobbler was demonstrating God's love in his workplace. Paul wants us to be working at love for others and to be showing God's love at work. Longfellow wrote in his poem, Footprints, Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. <coughs> Are you living a life that will leave its mark on the sands of time? A life of brotherly love that will encourage someone else along their way, direct them towards God and His mercy and grace? If you aren't, as a Christian, if you claim to be a Christian, you should be living that way. If you are, Paul says, great, excel still more. Pray for more. Love more than you ever have. But do it better. Do it more often. We're going to have an opportunity. Easter is coming. When we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. We can share Christ's love just simply by talking with people about what that day should mean. What, what's the significance of it? I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning as we get ready to sing our final song. In this box are some books called After Easter. And uh, I don't want to take any of them home. I want you to come and get in this box. There's not a lot of them. So, uh, well, we got four, eight, nine. We've got nine books. Anybody who has a, a friend that you want to share those with, you take, come and take at least one, you know, and, until they're all gone. But I, I want you to uh, have an opportunity. What, what it has in it, it's got the Gospel of John and it's got some devotional material with questions at the end of each of the devotions. It's something you could read with your friend, actually. And it's called After Easter. And so I want you to use that as a gift to invite a friend. I'd like to have nine people invited with, with that gift. Uh, nine of your friends. So anyone uh, who wants that, while we're singing this song, you come up and grab one and take it back with you. Uh, and like I say, I don't want to take any of them home with me. I want to put any of them back in my office. As you know, my office is a mess. Doesn't have any room for it. So let's stand together and commit to the Lord to be the kind of believers who love one another and love others. Let's stand. <coughs>